Good evening, guys. Um, I've been asked to do a little video on the um, the question of calculating ZS because <clears throat> we always kind of question: should we calculate it? Should we calculate? It? Well, we can calculate, but is it a good idea to calculate it? Uh, you know, parallels and things like that. So um, I thought I'd just look into the what the regulations say where the calculation comes from and whether we should calculate it or not and what we're missing out on if we only calculate okay so um, <clears throat> the common the common response then is yes you can calculate it because the regulations say we can obtain it by calculation inquiry or measurement well that's only for um, the inquiry is only for supply characteristics so the uh, ZE and PFC, so we can't inquire a, Z -E, uh, a ZS measurement, we just can't do that. You can only inquire a ZE or PFC, uh, you know, you do that if you, uh, when you're doing a new design and the supply characteristics are, are being collected for that part. Now, Regulation 6129 states that if your protective measure is used and requires knowledge of the earth for loop impedance, the relevant impedances will be measured. That's what it says. They'll be measured. Or they'll be determined by an alternative method. Now, it doesn't say or calculated. It says an alternative method. Now, what other methods there are than calculation? I don't know. Maybe witchcraft or something. I don't know. But it says you can measure it. Or determined by an alternative. It then says note that you can get further information in Appendix 14, um, <clears throat> but this alternative method is probably what they've used, and they've probably um, they've probably um, just twisted it around a little bit when they've come up with the idea of calculating all the time. Appendix 14. Let's look at that. And you mentioned a calculation here. Well, <laughs> well, clearly we have the word measurement straight away. So it's about the measurement of the earth for loop impedance and then considering the effect of the increase in the rise of conductor with the increase of rise of temperature. Um, so I'm not going to go through what this is all about, but you should understand that you know you have you have a cold installed cable, then you have a conductor under load, which obviously starts to resist more. Um, in here we have measurement, we have measurement, we have measurement, measurement. Um, so. Clearly, this is referring to measurement. That is the uh, the standard route. The standard route is to measure. Okay, so there's no question on calculation as the first approach here. However, it does say further down here. If your measured value, your measured value of the loop impedance doesn't exceed the 0 0.8 times U over I A value, the calculated value then it does say you can then assess the line conductor and protective conductor loop impedance along with the resistance of the line conductor protective conductor of the distribution and of the so it says you can calculate but that's calculating to verify a measurement first that you are not satisfied with so it's saying measure then calculate in the regulations so the greatest area is this alternative method? This is all BS seven six seven one has about calculation. So there's nothing else in the regulations itself. So the question then is, where does calculation come from? Where does it actually say yes, you can calculate it? Um, if it's not in the regulations, then it's going to be in the guidance material. Gaius Notes 3, and it is. Uh, bear in mind Gaius Notes 3 is not BS7671. It is guidance. It is strongly supported guidance, but it is guidance. Now it says here, in the middle of the document, uh, there are two methods used for verifying the total earth fault loop impedance. Uh, one is measurement of the total earth fault loop impedance using an instrument. Good. The other is measurement of the R1 plus R2 during the continuity test. And the addition of the measured earth for loop impedance external, the ZE. So it's saying uh, ZS is equal to ZE plus R1 plus R2. Uh, okay, but this this sentence then I just don't like at all. It says, which method is used comes down to a matter of personal choice 
and both are described below. Um, I don't know why they said personal choice. I mean, according to the wine regulations, you measure and then you calculate to verify a poor measurement. If they're using this as a, as a translation of when BS 7671 says an alternative method, um, fine, but they need to kind of mention that. And I don't think BS 7671 is written in a way that says whatever rocks your boat, whatever method is your personal choice. Because we're going to end up with what we have now, which is people just calculating it because it's quicker and cheaper and they just can't be asked. Um, personal choice is bad wording. Very bad wording. After the description of what, how to test them, it does have this bit, which tells you about the verification of the earthfall loop. And what it's saying there is obviously it's not only the inspector's job to actually go out and take the measurements, it's also the inspector's job when he hands the information back to the office to verify that the data is correct. Either he does that, she does that, or someone in the office does that. But verification of the test measurements must be made. So it says there the standard thermoplastic circuits comply with the requirements of Appendix A. The airflow of impedance figures provided by the designer also comply. So you take the numbers and then you refer, and that is where calculation really is used. We use calculation to design and to verify. We use me measurement to measure the bit in the middle. Okay, calculation for design, measurement, calculation for verification. That's how I see that it should be. All right. <clears throat> Moving forward, what are the benefits to calculate? A lot of people use calculation as a safety sake. They'll say, well, if you can do it via a calculation, you shouldn't take down an accessory and expose yourself to live parts. I even remember the NIC suggesting that in some of their training stuff. I think it was um, one of Tony Cable's testing videos in Houses. You go, oh, you can measure ZS with the socket, that's safe, but don't take down that light switch, just calculate it. I mean, you know, there's a difference between live work and, although testing is live work, it's a requirement to comply with electricity work regulations. You know, so shafting the work for the sake of a calculation is bollocks, in my view. Um, the other benefit of calculation is money, because obviously, you know, speed up the process. Uh, less dismantling and things like that. Problems with, that, uh, problems with calculating it, in my perspective, you have no access to the actual installation's condition, in my view. A um, couple of things that I use to highlight that would be the um, would be the uh, the parallel paths, which a lot of people pick up on, you know, which would obviously bring the value lower than calculation or lower than you'd expect but also the impedance measurement a lot of people don't think about the fact that it is an impedance measurement um, technically you have a resistance measurement which we do the R1 R2 which is a DC impedance uh, a resistance measurement all right so here we've got a demo circuit just a typical ring final uh, let's add a parallel so what we're going to do is put a boiler on this spur pipe work CPC there so you can see that so you're going to have your CPC going through the circuit then there's a CPC going to the boiler and then maybe a parallel back on the water pipe work to the board and if there's a fault here some of the earth fault current will go this way and some of it will go this way two parallel resistances okay so we understand that the parallel path introduces the alternative route. Now, this is going to result in a lower value of airflow loop impedance that is actually present. Um, is that a good thing? Yeah. Um, the thing is, what if that parallel disconnects later? So, if you've got a, if you've got a an airflow loop impedance that you expect it to be just shy of the mark, 
but maybe was way above but you didn't know that because the parallel brought it down it might be that once the parallel has been removed because it could be a temporary thing or it could be you know that pipe work has been changed from water to plastic suddenly that could be spiked up so it is important if you do have parallels and you're aware of them to calculate the test as well not instead of okay so measurement via cal um, verifying the measurement via calculation if it is believed that parallels are incorporated within your measurement. This is to verify the earthful loop impedance will be within the limits of the regulations if the parallel was to disappear. Now that does that does kind of argue in favour of calculation, but not as the starting method. That's a alternative method. The other thing we need to bear in mind when we do the uh, parallels is, well, yeah, a parallel has offered a lowered resistance. A lowered resistance, if you think about Ohm's law, lowering the resistance, has offered an increased current. So, when you have a parallel offering a lower resistance for an earth fault, you're actually also then saying, well, this parallel is going to increase earth fault. The earth fault current will increase. So, that can be potentially a problem. Whilst, whilst we can assume that this increase in current will just flow down the parallel that is there that's created it, the wine regulations unfortunately don't allow us to think of it that way. If you actually look in the regulations and you refer to regulation, uh, sorry, section 543, you'll see where, actually, where, where it covers the sizing of the protective conductor. It does say that the I in the formula is the actual uh, the value of current that is expected to flow through the protective device in the fault condition okay uh, the amount of fault current for fault of negligible impedance which can flow through the associated protective device so offering a parallel uh, as a as a, you know offering a parallel to the circuit lowers earth fault loop impedance that increases fault current that increased fault current will go through that protective device and so you need to confirm that increased fault current still fits in with the adiabatics calculation of conductor size. It might be that a parallel has resulted in your protective conductor being too small all of a sudden. Um, you know, it's just a, a knock-on effect. If you calculate this, you're not going to find any of this information out. And it could be that you calculate something, install it, and a protective conductor is now under size and under an earth fault condition. There is thermal constraint, and it does get damaged. Who knows? So verification of the protective conductor size with adiabatic is needed if a parallel is present, in theory. We also have the impedance. Now, when we're, when we're at college and we're training about R1, R2s and ZSs and ZEs, we're basically saying this one's impedance, this one's resistance, but add them together to get a total impedance. So 1 plus 1 is 2. In reality, it doesn't work that way, though. Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth, because I don't, you know, this, is a, this is the testing question that I'm answering here. But what we need to go maybe open up our old college books and have a little look at is what the differences are between impedance and resistance. Resistance itself, uh, as it says here, it's associated with the direct current. Um, and it's a measurement of... Resistance with direct current, where you have a constant voltage and a constant resistance, which results in a constant current. And as a result, if the voltage is constant, so the battery source doesn't diminish, then the current is constant. And if the voltage and the current are constant with so the resistance, the resistance will stay at the phase angle zero, along with the resistance and the current, because they're constant with each other. That's all well and good. But when we actually connect it to a AC circuit, we introduce um, a couple of things that can alter this phase angle, um, namely capacitors and inductors. I, again, I'm trying to keep this simple, but if you're going to do an earthfall loop impedance test and there is any capacitors or inductors, I mean, bear in mind a capacitor doesn't have to be a capacitor, it could be capacitance as well. But when you have a capacitor or an inductor in a circuit, or both, it will, depending on what it is, affect the current, either lagging or leading the voltage. 
Okay, obviously capacitors with the charging of the electrons on the plates, and then the inductors with the coil and the you know affected by its length and the electromagnetic field starting and stopping near a coil, you know, regular switching. Uh, I don't want to go into it too much, but what it does is it shifts it out of phase, either pushing the voltage, you know, pushing the current behind or pushing the current ahead. What you end up with is the amount of phase. One leads, one lags. If you have both in the circuit. There's an illustration here of, uh, sorry, this is the capacitance. You've got the lagging current. There's the voltage waveform. And then, you know, in, in, if it was purely resistive, the voltage and current would be together on this form. But because of capacitance and inductance, one is leading and one is lagging. So they are never one times the other equal. And so you can see here, here's the phase angle. One's leading, one's lagging. If it was resistance, the actual it would be steady on this line. What does this mean? Well, it means that we have a shift. We have a, a shift because of the phase change. We have non resistive components causing the current to be out of phase within the EMF. Now, the opposition, this is known as reactance. You can have inductive reactance, you can have capacitive reactance, but that is what impedance is. So it's where you have a non-resistive component of your circuit, which is um, basically stopping the electrons flowing uh, by obviously opposing them or impeding them, hence the term impedance. When you have a combination or a single one of these, you develop impedance. It's some form of reactance within your circuit. How you handle that, you have to analyze how much of your circuit is impeded is it all capacitive? Is it all inductive? Is it a combination of the two? Okay. If you have a circuit containing resistance and either inductance or capacitance, then there is impedance. Okay. It's not the same as resistance. The impedance of a circuit is the circuit's total opposition to the flow of current. In an AC circuit, the opposition consists of resistance and reactance, which is either inductive or capacitive. When we say it's either inductive or capacitive, what we have is if it's got both, you just have that one of which one has the most inductance, which one has the most capacitance, and the one that is largest will obviously deduct from the lowest. Um, most often they'll be inductive due to the length of the inductor, but it depends on what it is. You may have a highly capacitive circuit. But you deduct the you deduct you deduct one from the other, and the value you get if it's inductance, then you get that. If it's capacitance, then you get that. But you result in an angle from the horizontal of resistance. And you do an impedance triangle. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing through this because I don't want to explain it too much. But this impedance triangle, you can see here, there's your resistance, here's the reactance, which is probably inductant, inductive reactance. Okay, and then you've got the amounts, and then you have this line, Pythagoras. This line is impedance. We don't, we don't calculate that. When we calculate ZS is equal to R1 plus R2, uh, uh, and ZE, what we're actually doing is adding this when in reality a measurement incorporates the reactive components which gives us this. So in all likelihood it may be that a calculated value will result in a lower than actual because the capacitive or the inductive effect of the impedance would shift it out of phase. So in English if we calculate the earth full of impedance without adding the value of capacitance, the value of inductance, determining which of those results in which reactance, and then creating this kind of triangle to measure the actual value of impedance, we're not calculating it properly. And so should we calculate ZS? Well, we shouldn't because it's inaccurate. Um, there you go.